The culture of higher education is an important consideration as we embark on this journey of exploring academic governance. This presentation and lecture will establish a common understanding of culture so that we will all start from the same place. As you read this week's materials and the material yet to come, do so within the framework of the culture of higher education. What is culture? In the context of society, culture can be understood or defined in many ways. For example, in the humanities, it can refer to an appreciation of the artistic nature of our world. In the sciences, it is often associated with the growing of microorganisms in some controlled environment. And in the context of human nature, culture can be understood as the actions and attitudes shared among members of a social group. However, it is in the context of organizations that we approach our study of culture. Organizational culture can be best thought of as a question that drive our intentions with others in the organization. What are we th comfortable talking about? Who has power and how is it used? How does one advance or fall behind? What are the unwritten rules? How are values lived out among the members? What are our shared stories? Each of these does not add up to much when considered independently, but in combination these questions begin to define the organizational culture. In order for us to have a common reference as we consider academic governance, we need a single point of reference for what organizational culture is and how it is best understood. Therefore, for the purpose of this course, we will use Edgar Schein's definition of organizational culture as a system of shared backgrounds, norms, values, or beliefs among members of a group. There are many examples and models of organizational culture. In addition to Schein, models have been developed by Singe, Hofstede, Argyris and Sean, Berquist and Pollock, and Bowman and Deal. Each of these models explore organizational culture in a different way and all contribute to our understanding of organizations. However, three of these models deserve more attention as we discuss the culture of higher education. Singe posits organizations where people have the ability to develop in such a way as to evolve the culture, nurture thought, embrace ambition, and seek ways to learn together are known as learning organizations. Such organizations have mechanisms whereby people are challenged to fully develop their capacity and commitment. This model presents five disciplines or dimensions of culture building that converge to innovate the learning organization. Personal mastery suggests a special level of proficiency whereby one refines a personal vision and commits to a life of learning. Mental models are the values, biases, and assumptions that influence how we view the world and those in it. Building shared vision is the idea that everyone in the organization buys into a common goal, values, and mission. Team learning is the ability to suspend the biases and assumptions we carry with us and to approach learning with an open mind. Finally, it all comes together under the fifth discipline of systems thinking the conceptual framework that allows all members of the organization to effectively drive culture change. The five disciplines drive how we think, learn, and interact together. Bowman and Deal's four-frame model suggests as organizations grow and become more powerful, they become harder to lead, making them even more complex and confusing. Resulting from this ambiguity is narrow-minded management and leadership rooted in inadequate ideas of the realities of organizational life. This model presents four frames or perspectives of viewing the organization that bring clarity and meaning to the confusion. The structural frame focuses on rules and policies, goals and strategy, technology, environment, and the roles individuals assume in the organization. The human resources frame focuses on the people and their needs, relationships, and skills. The political frame focuses on politics and power, competition and conflict, and how decisions are made within the hierarchy. And finally, the symbolic frame focuses on culture, ritual, stories, and meaning. Each frame offers a powerful yet unique way of viewing the organization, and collectively they provide the means for a deeper understanding of organizational culture. 
Berquist and Pollock suggest higher education is not one single organization or culture. Instead, higher education consists of many organizations, each expressing its own unique culture. However, there is much similarity between these individual, often disparate institutions. Common among the various organizational cultures are the unique customs and traditions shared within the academy. This model, which is explored in more detail in week two, suggests six cultures that influence the way students, staff, and faculty members understand higher education and the potential for change within the academy. The six cultures are collegial, managerial, developmental, advocacy, virtual, and tangible. The culture of an organization for our purposes, higher education, can be examined on multiple levels according to Edgar Schein. On the surface level are artifacts, which include everything you experience when observing a group. Artifacts can range from the physical buildings and structures of the institution to the behaviors of its members. Just underneath the surface of what is seen are the espoused beliefs and values, which embody the organizational philosophy or vision. These include goals, values, and aspirations of what the institution is to become. Finally, through many years of shared learning evolves the basic underlying assumptions of the institution. Such assumptions as deeply held beliefs and values that determine the nature of the organization and drive the actions, thought, and perceptions of its members. What are some of the artifacts associated with higher education? Certainly you have the obvious buildings including classrooms, residence halls, and recreation facilities. But there are also large stadiums and arenas that begin to reveal something more about the underlying assumptions of higher education. In addition to the obvious, there are also tangible items such as the academic calendar, the catalog, and other publications that speak volumes about the culture. Finally, there are some not so tangible items such as budgets and endowments that contribute to the overall culture. Many of these artifacts are taken for granted because they have become a part of what we expect from higher education. What are the espoused beliefs and values underlying traditional higher education? Derek Bach, in his book, Our, Understand Our Underachieving Colleges, suggests that the contemporary college experience would be best enhanced and society much improved if colleges can do a better job of helping their students communicate with greater precision and style, think more clearly, analyze more rigorous, rigorously, become more ethically discerning, and be more knowledgeable and active in civic affairs. Bach goes on to pro provides a succinct summary of the historic beliefs and values of higher education that have resided in our traditional two-semester model of instruction, where students have ample access to come on campus and learn in classrooms and laboratories filled with the latest and greatest technologies. While certainly not an exhaustive discussion, this does begin to shed some light into the traditional culture of higher education. However, the evolving culture of higher education is becoming one of choice. As James Koch wrote, the higher education market now resembles the American restaurant market, with many choices including gourmet restaurants to fast food franchises to food trucks. As such, higher education now presents an opportunity for almost any student from those who want to learn to those who simply want to enjoy the latest technology and climbing walls. What are the basic underlying assumptions of higher education? Historically, there has been implied value in going to college and obtaining a baccalaureate degree. High schools have structured college prep curriculums to drive students toward this ideal status. State funding agencies have provided adequate dollars allowing students to access higher education in increasing numbers. Institutions have responded by hiring faculty to provide classroom instruction in much the same format as existed decades earlier. Expectations have changed little over the years, until now. These assumptions are being challenged with reduced funding and declining access. Failure to change the basic model of teaching and instruction has caused many to question the direction of higher education, and the question is being raised as to who should bear the brunt of the costs of higher education, the federal government, the state government, or the student. With no one single definition of academic governance, nor one simple model to suggest, as the best or most effective governance structures exist within the context of the academic culture of the institution and the broader culture of higher education in general. 
There are some common elements of academic governance, as there is a common culture among many institutions, particularly those within the same country. But with the changing rhythm of higher education and the removal of time and space from the education equation comes an evolving culture that will potentially lead to newer and more efficient models of governance. The question is, what will remain in the aftermath of this evolution, and will it be recognizable within our current understanding of academic governance?